Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to another episode of Chasing Clarity Health and Fitness Podcast. I'm Jeff Black. I'm joined with my co-host, as always, looking beautifully faded, Brandon DeCruz. Yeah, show that baby off. But today, we it's episode 115. We're going to talk about cardio and metabolism, how aerobic training boosts your metabolic rate, and da- total daily energy expenditure, a.k.a. your TDEE. So, B, you want to give like one thing that's really gone on in your last week that you want to share with people that you could give out quick and I'll do one and then we'll get this thing going. Uh, Yeah, man. Uh, So within the last week, actually, no, no, we're doing a full recap. People have been asking for it. We got a short episode today. Let's let's get into it. So uh, within the last week, it's been my birthday. So that's one thing. The second thing is uh, I have an upcoming trip to Phoenix next week. Uh, so I'm looking forward to to getting out there. I've yet to be to Phoenix, and I'm looking forward to checking out some gyms. I'm meeting up with some clients of mine, long-term clients. So I'm really looking forward to that, being able to really engage with them in person. These are individuals that have come to actually some of our seminars. Uh, so for instance, uh, Natalie uh, is one of the coaches that was just at our most recent charity seminar. So uh, I'm looking forward to linking up with her. One of my clients, Jeremiah, is going to be in the area. So we're going to be linking up for training sessions. So I'm very much looking forward to that. And I'm also officially into my uh, photo shoot prep. So I had done, I transitioned to the diet last week. What I like to often do is after a long building phase, I do this with myself. I do this with clients as well, is that the first week of a fat loss phase, if the person is, is still has accumulated fatigue, from that, that full long mesocycle of building, I'll run a deload and then I'll just transition them into the diet. So last week I only transitioned into the diet and then I ran a deload just to dissipate fatigue and really start off this fat loss phase in a refreshed and reset state. So I just started a new training cycle. I've switched from uh, doing an upper lower split essentially where I was training six days per week. So I was doing three upper days and three lower days. And now I'm running a push pull leg split and I'll do that twice per week or two rotations of that per week. So, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, getting skinned uh, this summer, uh, getting real lean. And, um, you know, other than that, man, everything's going well on my end. It's the beginning of June. This will go out, you know, mid June because we're we're pretty much ahead on on episodes. However, uh, it's been a really productive start to the month and I'm very much looking forward to it. I have a lot of people that are doing photo shoot preps themselves. So we're kind of like I'm in the trenches with them. So I have a lot of people that are that are getting ready for photo shoots for weddings. Um, And then also some guys that are getting ready for contest prep, uh, whether that be a local or an amateur show. And then I also have uh, one of my long-term clients who's doing his first national show. So I'm very much looking forward to what's to come this summer. Uh, It's going to be a very productive summer. And uh, I have a lot of things going on, especially, you know, off air, you and I have spoken personally. I have a lot of uh, personal moves that I'll be making that will not only facilitate a better quality of life and more fulfillment, but also help me get to the next level from a business perspective. So, man, all is well on my end. How about you? You know, man, I have uh, zero complaints. We uh, I'm working real hard, getting my books in the people's hands. The formal launch for that will come in November on Amazon. Uh, The guy who's helping me has been nothing short. He's so Robo was impressed with him. You know how hard it is to press. Yeah, dude, I'm like shocked over here. My facial expression. If anyone Robo hired him, Robo hired him as consultant. Yeah, that's how blown away I was. I was like, wow, shit, you actually must know your stuff because Robo's, every time he brings up Robo, he's like, no, like always like swats down my dreams and hopes. But, you know, that's what good friends do. They're not your hype team. And I try to tell people that. But besides that, man, um, me and Thera got this golden goose opportunity dropped in our lap that her and I just are kind of like waiting to work on the first round of stuff to get some answers. But if it does uh, go the way that we think it might go, it's life-changing from a business perspective. Uh, Business has been good. I appreciate all y'all who've inquired with me. If you even listen to this podcast, wherever you're getting my, getting little Jeff from, but uh, things have been good. I'm teaching my 16 year old daughter how to drive. That's exciting. Uh, She hasn't, she's only killed about killed us twice. I was like, Oop, dead. Like doing like the airsoft thing, like, Oh, we're dead. And she's like, Oh my God. I'm like, it's fine. You know, you gotta die a few times in order to live. So, um, but it's been good. Keegan, Keegan's been, um, out with friends causing trouble. He's, uh, really into that cool, too cool for school stage, uh, where all the girls are harassing him and surrounding him. And he's too busy getting ripped in the gym. Walked out in the garage. My there. man. Walked out in the garage there. Him and his buddies are like out there benching and curling with the weights. And I was like, I'm not going to disturb this bromance. I just went back inside and decided to be a good parent. But it's been good, man. I, I kind of have my schedule. I've been very, very strict about it this summer to have some time 
to be able to do some things with them um, because, you know, they are getting older. And mm -hmm. for once in my life, I actually have time. You know, that's often what happens with men who have kids. A lot of us men who did it, like in our mid-20s, like me, I, I found the a lot of those years were having to spend working two jobs, 60, 70 hours to make it meet. And it was all worth it. And, you know, I always thought that I banked on, I might not be the as present as I could be physically, but I'd make sure they didn't have a want or a need that I couldn't take care of knowing that damn right well later on in the years of their lives as men, young men, that they would find more value out of me because of what I've been through myself and ultimately the journey that they are taking. So we shall see. But with that being said, let's get into this damn episode. The first Joe Jeffries uh, seminar. If you guys are a fan of Joe Jeffrey, me and Brandon love him. He is from the UK. He is top notch dude, top notch coach, high level, brilliant man. Him and his team, the Physique Collective, they are coming over from Britain to hang with us in the United States. Now, Brandon is going to go with us, but I booked us a day where we're Brandon, we're taking the Brits to the shooting range. Let's go, <laughs> dude. Let me get them out of their element. It's like I get a fire the AR and I'm like, you can fire my AR, Joe. I'll let you do it. So oh, yeah. we're going to do that. But the seminar itself, guys, is going to be Friday, September 27th, Saturday, September 28th, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. both days. It'll be off site about 10 minutes up the street from my gym. My friend owns a restaurant with a private area that we could feed, fit 50 people in, 40 probably comfortably 50 squeezing it. Um, and Sunday is going to be the 29th. It's going to be a group workout. So you get a three day seminar for $300. Can't beat be that, honestly. Yeah, no, dude, you can't be it because I remember when we were doing PEC, we were up there at the 600 bucks to get the speaker. And, and honestly, uh, not to interrupt you, but I've done, I actually had a, a memory pop up. So I worked with John Meadows back in the day. Uh, he did my training programming and I had, I can't even express the amount of respect and love that I had for, for John as a man and as a coach and as a fitness professional. Um, and I did a few seminars with John and it was thousands of dollars. And I actually had, you know, John, you know, rest in peace, uh, someone I, I greatly miss uh, just as a, a force in this industry. But I actually had a memory pop up yesterday. It was the last time that I saw John. It was June 10th, 2019. So that was the last seminar that he did in the Northeast uh, before, obviously, the next year he was doing a, a tour. And it was actually him and Stan Efferding. And um, that one wasn't too expensive, but we're still talking about a one day seminar within the 500 plus dollars. And it was more than worth it, its weight in gold, essentially. And um, I look back on that that opportunity and it was someone that John was in Ohio. So I actually went to a seminar in Ohio. I drove out there uh, one year. However, um, these are opportunities that you guys don't know if you're ever going to get them again. I've had the opportunity and I've spent more money than you can imagine on my education, but especially those in-person seminars prior to 2020, when they were much more prominent and they were much more, um, I guess they were more readily available in terms of just the the amount of um, seminars that were offered each and every year. We used to do a lot of in-person events. There weren't these online formats. There weren't online certification companies and things of that sort. And I just want to express like that had a huge impact on the early uh, transition of my career and development as a fitness professional. The first one I ever went to was in 2013. The second one was 2014. It was Lane Norton. It was the first individual that I ever saw within this space that told us that he was doing this full time making six figures and it kind of put that that idea in my mind that this is possible and and another thing was I went out to a seminar in 2017 for John and uh, I asked him he had left JP Morgan Chase you know that uh, you know um John Meadows had a full time corporate banking career and I asked him you know at that time I was coaching it, but it was it was still a small thing I was 4 years into it and I had that that admiration or I had that um, ambition to eventually do this full time. I had the corporate supplement career that I had, but uh, it was always in the back of my mind, is this possible? And I remember having that conversation with John and him just giving me some really good and heartful uh, message or just insight and advice as to what to do, how to do it, you know, when to, to look, when are you ready to actually move from that corporate career and leave that financial security and when to know to go all in on yourself. And, and that's another thing that our friend Jason uh, Theobald has really um, helped me with as well. When we've had conversations as have you. Um, and eventually I did obviously make that transition but these are once in a lifetime opportunities that's essentially what i'm trying to get across we don't know i have worked with joe and been friends with joe for over five years i mean i've known joe even longer than that but we've been doing skype consultations it was it was that far back that it was on skype you know what i mean it wasn't even zoom um for at least five years and he has very rarely been in the states and he's very excited to be here we talk about it on a weekly basis during our own calls and so i just want to express to you guys out there if you're hesitant whatever um Dude, it's a drop in the bucket, three hundred dollars. I'm not trying to, um, you know, throw anyone's money in and make it seem like it, it, it's it's nothing. It's an investment, but it's something that's going to come back tenfold. I will tell you, I've, I've spent over two thousand dollars in just a single 
seminar series that I've done or that I've been a part of or, the, or that I've attended. And so I just want to express to you guys, if you're hesitant, if you think that, um, you know, you're uncomfortable or you're someone that's introverted. Like these are events where you're going to be surrounded by like-minded individuals. This is a great opportunity. I have had many of my clients over the years at presentations that I've been at, that I've been a part of, such as when you've had me out for the PECs and now with the, the charity events for ATG. Um, I've had clients come out and meet me and I've been working with them for years and it's an immense opportunity to get to, to bond with them in person, meet them, connect with them. Um, you're going to meet people that are going to be lifelong friends. I mean, I, I can say that wholeheartedly because I'm, I'm looking across the, the lens at someone that I met from social media, essentially, and through podcasting. And then eventually he's become one of my closest friends. We do a podcast together, but also how we really bonded was me coming down to Nashville multiple times, especially that first time. That was actually a birthday present that I received. And I came down to one of the PCs. And after that, I, I started speaking at them. So you never know what these opportunities are going to lead to. So I, you know, I know that uh, this Jeff is, is personally involved in this. This is his event. But at the same time, I do want to just uh, put a stamp of approval and also some encouragement to anyone out there that's listening and that's saying, Oh, you know what? I would love to do that, but you're always giving yourself a butt. Um, you know, it's travel or it's an expense, or you know, maybe I'll go next time. Like there may not be a next time. I'm just gonna put it out there. And that's why I always think about the investments that I've made into individuals that have never come back to the States, or in the unfortunate case with John, he's no longer around. So uh, I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, no, and I appreciate that, man. Joe's a good dude. It, I, I think if anything, if you're a coach, it'd be cool to hear how the UK bodybuilders, UK, UK fitness enthusiasts, you, because Matt's with him, so he's heavy gym pop and stuff like that, do things different over there. I think it's always cool to get like a different lens to see through. But nonetheless, you guys will see it going up on my social, Brandon social, and Joe's. So with that being said, let's get in the episode. And I do owe you all a real quick apology. What you occasionally hear in the episode is my CEO sending me something and the video will pop up and click. I don't know why. I just deleted the damn thing off my phone if you're or the, my computer, the WhatsApp. So you shouldn't go forward. But uh, if you're a tech person, know how to prevent WhatsApp when it opens a message off the video, let me know. But with that being said, Episode 115, Cardio and Metabolism, How Aerobic Training Boosts Your Metabolic Rate and TDEE. Okay, let's get into this. Brandon, topic of cardio and metabolism. Both you and I were kind of like, yay, a conversation about cardio. But we get a lot of questions about this, and this is something that confuses a lot of people. A lot of people think of cardio like your high school gym class where you're just supposed to have your doors blown off you for 30 minutes to an hour to just steps to everything in between. And we thought we'd kind of break it out a little bit, talk about what it does to your metabolism and talk about some variances with it. And so with that being said, man, let's get into this. Yeah. So on the last two episodes of the show that we have done, we have covered strategies that can help build and maintain your metabolism and ultimately boost your total daily energy expenditure. So if we go back a couple episodes ago, we go back to um, episode 113 of the show, we covered the nutritional strategies for increasing your total daily energy expenditure. And then on last week's show, which was episode 114, we covered training your metabolism, which essentially was an all-encompassing topic about how building muscle increases your metabolic rate and total daily energy expenditure. And within that episode specifically, we discussed how engaging in progressive resistance training increases your metabolism. So what I wanted to do on today's podcast was to make an extension of that essentially. And you guys know, I love my series, Jeff, you know, I, I'm all about series and doing these sequentially. And so in today's podcast, really what I wanted to do was to cover how cardio and aerobic training impacts metabolism and how it can boost your metabolic rate and your total daily energy expenditure. So cardio, which is also referred to as aerobic training. So I'm going to use that interchangeably just so you guys don't get confused. It's one and the same. Um, it provides a ton of benefits to our metabolic health, our longevity, and due to its effects on energy expenditure, it can be a powerful tool for improving body composition, especially if your goal is to drop body fat. So engaging in regular aerobic training or cardio improves your insulin sensitivity levels, your nutrient partitioning abilities, and your blood glucose management, which all in turn improve your metabolic health status and how you dispose of nutrients you eat, especially the carbohydrates you consume. And that's really where we're seeing a lot of issues within today's society, especially Americans. Uh, we see that over 93% of Americans today are metabolically unhealthy, meaning they have one of the metabolic syndrome criteria and one of the most prevalent indices of poor metabolic health is um, improper uh, blood glucose control and high elevated, whether it be fasting blood glucose, HbA1c, fasting insulin, things of that sort. So this is one modality that can help improve that. We also see 
that doing cardio increases mitochondrial biogenesis. It's one of the most potent, most effective uh, methods or strategies to increase that, which is essentially just the creation of more mitochondria, which is going to lead to greater rates of energy production. So when we do cardio, we not only develop more mitochondria through this aerobic training, but we also improve the function of our mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. So we're able to produce energy more efficiently and also utilize that energy more efficiently. So a little bit of a, a onslaught to that or, or a back half to that is that cardio helps to improve your metabolic flexibility, which allows you to more effectively switch between utilizing fat and carbohydrates for fuel based on what activity you're doing. Now, for instance, if you're someone that is metabolically deranged or dysfunctional, or you have insulin resistance, uh, pre-diabetes, type 2 diabetes, things of that sort, you're essentially metabolically inflexible. You're having an inability to switch between fuel substrates. So we want to avoid that first and foremost, but we really want to aim for good metabolic flexibility, which the reason that this is really important, really in the context of a metabolism perspective is because our basal metabolism actually runs off the aerobic system and it runs off of fat oxidation. It runs in the background at low intensities. So if you do cardio and you improve your aerobic capacity and your aerobic fitness levels, you can more efficiently burn fat at rest, which will also help you to preserve your glycogen stores. So essentially what we're doing is when we're at low intensity activities, if you're in good aerobic shape, you're going to be burning fat for energy in the background. So even during your day-to-day -day activities, your walks, um, your activities of daily living, or even just at, at rest, actually at when you're sleeping, you're going to be burning more fat for energy and you're going to be preserving glycogen during those times. However, when you, when you turn it up, essentially you turn it up to 11 and you start engaging in higher intensity forms of exercise, specifically resistant training, you will need to use glucose. So if you're able to preserve that glucose by being metabolically flexible, you're going to have more um, stores in the tank, essentially, to be able to, to run on high octane fuel when you have those resistant training sessions. Now, if you are someone that's metabolically inflexible, you might be a sugar burner. So you may be utilizing and burning through glucose just during low intensity activities, which really is not going to be conducive for performance or metabolic health. And then last but not least, Cardio increases energy expenditure, which is going to help with maintaining a lean, healthy body composition and physique, which is what we're really going to focus on today's episode. Because within the context of the last two episodes, we've really been talking about metabolism and total daily energy expenditure. Like how do nutrition, how does resistance training, and now how does aerobic training impact our metabolic rate and our total daily energy expenditure? And I really want to dig into this topic because I think a lot of people only think about cardio as a tool for burning calories, which it is. It's an immensely uh, useful tool for that, but it actually has effects on metabolic rate that I think a lot of people discount or just aren't even aware of. So I do want to tease through that because this is something that I, I'll be honest with you and very forthcoming. Um, cardio is like the number one thing. I, I, I work with a lot of body composition you know, focused individuals. I've worked with a lot of competitors, bodybuilders, things of that sort, but even my general population clients, Cardio is like the number one thing that I look at their check-ins besides like dietary things where there's adherence issues and things of that sort. It's always like the number one thing they skip. You know what I mean? It's like, they don't see the utility in it. And that's because they're very body composition focused. So they think that there isn't a utility to cardio. And there are certain individuals that there are in the exact opposite spectrum. So I have a couple individuals that I got to titrate back their cardio because they're cardio buttons. They come from that endurance training background. But if I was to look at an all encompassing viewpoint of my last 11 years of, of, of coaching, the vast majority of individuals that I work with don't see the utility, don't see the benefit, and don't understand the role that cardio actually plays. So that's really why I wanted to tease into this, because when I can relate it back and under, and, and explain the mechanisms um, behind how cardio impacts body composition, energy expenditure, and metabolic rate, then it gives you an impetus to be more interested in it, to um, be more consistent with it. And also, I really do believe, and this is something I've seen in my coaching practice, in all the information I've presented and with the thousands of clients I've worked with is that education leads to empowerment and empowerment helps someone buy into a program more. And buying into a program more is one of the number one uh, methods or tools to get someone to be more consistent. And consistency is the fucking golden goose, man. It is what is going to get you to your goals. Okay. So then you kind of, you know, kind of foreshadowed it, I guess. How does cardio increase metabolic rate and your total daily energy expenditure? Are you going to talk about G flux today? That no, no, I'm saving that one, man. I'm going to oh, do fair, a, a fair, G flux. Fair, fair. Yeah, no, I'm going to do a G flux revisited uh, eventually. Uh, you know, I have some travel coming up, but I am going to do a revamp on how I've been uh, changing my approach to energy flux. I still use the high energy flux lifestyle model that I've spoken about on many podcasts, including our own. We did a, a podcast, I believe it was probably in the first 15, at least I'm, I'm going to say, I don't know the exact episode, but I know it was at least in the first 15 episodes that we ever did for the show. I did a full energy flux episode 
I also did a two-part series on your old podcast on specifically G-Flux uh, or Energy Flux. I've done dozens of them. I've done multiple presentations, including a presentation with yourself on Energy Flux. Um, I have some updated thoughts on that, but I'm going to save that. I I've really been building that out. I want to get some of the client case studies and really work through them and really um, be able to, to bring you guys probably a full series on Energy Flux. So if you guys are interested in that, definitely reach out. But today, specifically, I'm going to talk about aerobic training because Energy Flux is an all-encompassing model where I utilize different titrations of physical activity, cardio, uh, movement, steps, uh, even standing at times uh, to be able to really increase energy expenditure and get people to move more and eat more. However, when it comes specifically to cardio, doing cardio and performing aerobic exercise increases our metabolic rate and our total daily energy expenditure, both during a session and after a session. So cardio is an energy demanding activity. So during a cardio session, we need to burn calories to provide enough energy for our bodies to engage in this activity. Now, when we look at cardio and resistance training head to head, if we were to compare their effects on energy expenditure, if we're looking purely to burn more calories over a given period of time, cardio beats out resistance training pretty much 10 times out of 10. And that's because cardio is a continuous activity, whereas resistance training is an intermittent activity, meaning that during your, your resistance training sessions, we take rest periods and breaks between sets, which actually lowers our energy expenditure. And this is why, actually, I, I can link this back to energy flux. This is why within my own um, approach to training, I personally don't sit in between my sets during my resistance training sessions. And instead, what I do is I take laps around the gym during my rest periods so that I can accumulate steps during my rest periods, which allow me to get a good chunk of steps out of the way during my actual training sessions which increases the amount of calories I burn each session. And it also helps me to essentially economize on time as I'm killing two birds with one stone by training and getting steps in during each of my workouts. And this is also something that I've suggested to many of my clients, especially those who struggle to get their steps up. So this is one way we can incorporate it. But really, if we were to do a comparison, like a direct comparison of say 60 minutes of steady state cardio, like a uh, 60 minute steady state cardio session with a 60 minute resistance training session, doing 60 minutes of cardio will increase energy expenditure or calories burned more than the 60 minute resistance training session, which is why you should be doing both cardio and resistance training as each is a different tool to benefit your body composition. When we look at cardio, cardio is more effective for burning calories and helping to aid in creating a deficit and burning body fat. Whereas resistance training is more effective for building muscle and building the type of shape that you want for your physique. And so we can increase energy expenditure through various types of training, including both resistance training and um, cardio training. Now, when it comes to how many calories we burn specifically during cardio, this is based primarily on two factors, and that is the duration of your cardio session. So essentially, how long are you doing cardio for? How long are you active for within that cardio session? And then the second factor is the intensity of your cardio, which means how hard are you pushing yourself during that cardio session? So that, you know, how many uh, calories cardio burns during the session itself, but also we have to take into consideration, and this is what many people, um, I guess, overlook, is that cardio also helps you burn more calories after you finish doing that session as well. And this is because cardio causes an elevation in your resting metabolic rate and causes an increase in excess post-oxygen consumption, aka EPOC. So this EPOC causes us to burn more calories after cardio due to its effects on aerobic metabolism, which is why it's often referred to as the afterburn effect. So when people um, will discuss this, you'll either hear them use EPOC, which is the technical term, or you'll just hear them say, you know, I, I got a big afterburn effect from that cardio. Now, the EPOC that we get from cardio isn't massive, but generally what we see is that as cardio duration and intensity increases, we get a larger afterburn effect. And there seems to be a linear increase in the duration of cardio performed and the afterburn effect that we get from it. So essentially what we're looking at is the longer of an exercise session you do in terms of the aerobic training session itself. So the longer you do cardio for it in terms of one session, the higher the EPOC, you get, or EPOC that you get from it. So even after cardio, we see slight elevations in energy expenditure as compared to when we haven't done those cardio sessions. And this is something that I actually take into consideration with the clients that I work with. So one of the methods that I utilize that I have a preference or a bias towards is I will have clients do uh, cardio on non-training days, especially during a thallus phase, as this allows them to expend more calories during the cardio sessions and also to stay in an elevated metabolic state for the rest of the day, especially because on those rest days, they're not getting those added benefits from resistance training where they're seeing an elevation in their energy expenditure levels. And then also we know that resistance training um, elevates resting metabolic rate quite precipitously. So 
quite substantially. And this was something we covered in last week's podcast, but when you're not actively training, so say that you're training a uh, resistance training four days per week and you go Monday through Thursday. And then from Friday to Sunday, you, you take off for, for the weekend, essentially to spend time with your family or you're traveling or whatever it may be, you're going to be in a decreased state of metabolic rate, essentially, once you get past a certain uh, proximity away from your last training session. So this is where we can add in cardio sessions and essentially make up for that, essentially, um, and, and just get an increase in energy expenditure. And that's going to really help to drive a greater deficit. Or even if you're in, say, a maintenance phase, it's going to help you be able to eat more because you're expending more energy. Okay, so let's get into what the research is on cardio's effect on metabolic rate by the way you and me we're both fans of cardio so like 100 i think this is why this episode might be hard <laughs> for uh like where we want like we could talk we could just spend hours ladies and gentlemen telling you to do your cardio but brandon why does the research say you should do it for the metabolic rate no absolutely so i think everyone out there really knows and, and they're aware of the fact that cardio burns calories and thus increases total daily energy expenditure and this is one of the main reasons why cardio is such a popular form of exercise, especially for the goal of losing body fat. However, something I've realized that many aren't aware of and they don't know is that doing formal cardio sessions and being intentional and consistent with them actually will increase your resting metabolic rate. So it's well known that resistance training, which is something we covered last week, increases resting metabolic rate. But there's also research which has looked at the effect of cardio on metabolic rate. So for example, in one study, Researchers compared a high volume training session, a resistance training session, with an hour long session of steady state cardio. And although the resistance training session led to greater elevations in resting metabolic rate, the hour of steady state cardio elevated resting metabolic rate by around 100 calories over a period of 24 hours. There's also a recent systematic review and meta analysis that looked at the effects and the impact of different exercise interventions on specifically resting metabolic rate. And within this meta-analysis and the systematic review, essentially, they looked at aerobic training and resistance training studies and analyzed their effects on resting metabolic rate. And in the studies they analyzed, they measured participants' resting metabolic rate both pre- and post-training, so at the start of an intervention and then after it, to see the effects that each type of training had on these participants and these individuals' resting metabolic rate. And what they found was that aerobic training increased resting metabolic rate by an average of 82 calories per day while resistance training increased resting metabolic rate by an average of 96 calories per day. So there is a difference between the two. Now, the thing is that when most people think about how training increases resting metabolic rate, they solely think about how the act of training to build muscle increases metabolic rate, which is one of the most effective ways to elevate metabolic rate and total daily energy expenditure because muscle is such metabolically active tissue. However, what a lot of people don't realize, and this is what I'm trying to get across with just being consistent, especially with your cardio, is that there are independent increases in resting metabolic rate just from training. And this is really takes place when you train regularly. As the more active you are, it's going to cause an increase in protein turnover, which is an energy expensive process. So what we see both with cardio and resistance training is that we have elevations in protein synthesis and elevations in muscle breakdown. And so essentially this process of protein turnover is something that we see in the literature to account for approximately 20% of our resting energy expenditure, the resting metabolic rate, essentially. So when you engage in both resistance training and aerobic training, aka cardio, there's a lot more metabolic processes going on in the body, which requires calories to fuel and recover from. So this is a way to get the most bang for your buck by utilizing a multimodal approach to body composition improvement. And this is why I'm a big fan, especially when people have the goal of fat loss, is not just looking at a single thing, like one tool and, and one ring to rule them all. It's like, listen, there are so many methods to get to the end destination you want. However, there are more optimal methods and then there's also more suboptimal methods. So there are some people that are of the ideology that when they're trying to lose body fat, they're just going to go diet alone. And they are the individuals that just go on a low calorie diet. They don't resist and train. They don't utilize cardio. We see that they lose a, a much higher amount of lean mass or muscle mass during those fat loss phases. Then there's certain individuals when they want to optimize their body composition, they only focus on cardio. And then it's like, listen, you have um, an exercise intervention that's expending calories, but you're not getting the resistance training benefits where you're building muscle and maintaining muscle during that deficit. And then there's other another crowd where it's like the, the fuck cardio crew, essentially, where they don't believe in doing cardio because they have this um, very uh, antiquated viewpoint of the concurrent training and the interference effect, which isn't really um, interference effect essentially refers to that will cardio will decrease your gains. But in all the recent meta-analysis and systematic reviews on this topic, we see that it does not impair hypertrophy gains in terms of muscle gain. And so 
there's some individuals that they only do resistance training, but then they're noticing that they need to either diet much longer or they have to get to very, very low calorie diets because they don't have any other vector to pull essentially to be able to induce a greater calorie deficit. And really what I try to do is a multimodal approach. Let's create some of the deficit from diet. Let's utilize the, the dietary intervention or the dietary manipulations as a foundation to really increase the deficit itself or to induce a deficit. Then let's utilize the resistance training to build that foundation of muscle, to maintain that, that body that you want, that muscle mass that you want, and keep an elevated resting metabolic rate. And then you get to utilize cardio to burn calories, increase your cardiovascular health, and get all of the um, the multimodal uh, metabolic effects that it can have that are separate from resistant training. So this is really looking at things from a, let's fit each uh, piece of the puzzle in its place to really optimize your approach towards body composition optimization. Okay, so let's get into the final component. HIT, high intensity interval training versus steady state cardio for increasing energy expenditure and fat loss. All right. So one of the most common questions I've received when discussing cardio over the years and including discussing cardio on this podcast is what form of cardio is best? Is it high intensity interval training or is it steady state continuous cardio? And this is a debate that's honestly waged on for decades at this point. And I really think it comes down to the person and the client population that we're working with and that we're speaking to. However, when it comes to cardio's impact on energy expenditure and fat loss, we have a good amount of research that compares both HIT versus steady state, which is how I'm going to tackle this question and this topic on today's particular episode. So when we compare HIT cardio versus steady state cardio's impacts specifically on energy expenditure, aka how many calories you burn, we have to look at both the amount of calories burned in the session itself, so the session of cardio itself, and the amount of calories burned after the session itself. So a 2016 study investigated the energy expenditure effects of different forms of cardio compared against one another. And this is a study that I always go back to in terms of when someone asks me this question, I always think about this study because it's essentially it's results really show that it's not, it's, you know, often we're overlooking certain components. If we're not looking at the full picture, if you only look at things in isolation, you're missing the all encompassing viewpoint. It's the same thing with if you took on a client and you didn't look at their diet and you only looked at your training or vice versa, it's, we need to get an all encompassing picture to really see and really consider what is the best tool for the job essentially. So within this study, what they did was they wanted to test um, essentially the different energy expenditure or total daily energy or total energy expenditure of different forms of cardio. So to test this, they took active participants who had, were already training and they put them through a randomized crossover trial, meaning that they had them go through three different cardio conditions in separate days, as well as they randomized them. So they were in different orders for each person. So it was pretty much able to make this a very controlled study. And so in one condition, they had to perform sprint interval training by performing Wingate sprints, which if you guys are to look this up, if you're not familiar with it, I really suggest you look this up on YouTube or on TikTok or whatever your source of uh, audio content is, look up Wingate sprints, because this is one of the highest intensity forms of cardio you can do. So if you guys are familiar with Generation Iron, this always comes back to me uh, in terms of when I think Wingate sprints, I think about Ben Picolsi in the research lab in Florida doing Wingate sprints until he almost throws up. And this is a form of cardio that's incredibly brutal. So I doubt that many of you out there have ever done it first and foremost, because if you're not in an exercise science lab, you're most likely not going to do it. Or if you're not in a high level, like Olympic training program, you're most likely not going to do it. And then also it's something that is so brutal and, and induces so much anxiety in most people that do it, that many of you are not going to do this on a regular basis. So that was one condition. So this, keep in mind, this is a research study. So they did, they brutalize these people essentially with the sprint interval training. And then in the next condition, they had them perform hit interval cardio, which is more similar to what we would be familiar with, which would be time on and time off, essentially going as, you know, to a, a certain degree of maximum uh, heart rate and then having a rest interval in between. And then in the last condition, they just did our normal steady state cardio session. Then after each condition, so after each cardio session, they monitored their epoch in the three hours following these training sessions. Now, when it specifically came down to EPOC, so the excess post-oxygen consumption, aka the afterburn effect, they found that the sprint intervals burned the most calories from EPOC. And this is because it was the most energetically demanding. It was the most intense form of cardio they did. So when we look at just the sprint intervals, after that session, just from the sprint intervals, they burned an extra 110 calories. So this was quite significant. Now, when it was the hit intervals, they were next in order of terms of EPOC, and they burned an extra 83 calories after the hit interval session. 
Then the steady state had the lowest effect on EPAC. So they burned an extra 63 calories after that session. So if we just compare the hit intervals and the steady state cardio, which realistically are the two forms of cardio that any of us would do in the real world, we see that hit cardio has a 20 calorie advantage in EPOC as those in the, when they were in the hit group, essentially, they burn an average of 83 calories post-session as compared to 63 calories after the steady state session. However, when we look at the total energy expenditure for each session, meaning how many calories these participants burned in total, both during and after the session. So not just the EPOC, I'm looking at the full calorie burn from those sessions and after the session. We actually see the opposite order. So what ends up happening is in this specific study, they found that steady state cardio burned the most calories. It burned 348 calories in total. The next um, in terms of order of calorie burn were hit uh, intervals, which burned 329 calories in total. And then the sprint intervals, despite being the most intense and having the highest EPOC, they actually burned the least amount of calories and they burned 271 calories in total. So although higher forms or higher intensity forms of cardio do yield a greater epoch or afterburn effect, this doesn't mean that it will yield more calories being burned, which is really what you want to focus on when your goal is to do cardio for increasing energy expenditure and to aid in body fat loss. So that is on the energy expenditure side of things, like what form of cardio. We see very similar effects from both HIIT training as well as steady state cardio. And, and when it comes down to epoch, we see a little bit of an advantage on uh, hit training, but we see more of an advantage for total energy expenditure from steady state. Now, when we go on to the topic of fat loss and body composition outcomes between the different forms of cardio, we see that there are very similar outcomes between both steady state and hit cardio. So in a 2017 systematic review and meta-analysis, which looked at interval training versus continuous cardio's effects on body adiposity, which essentially is just your body fat levels, they found similar outcomes in terms of decreases in body fat and body weight from both types of cardio. And so when we actually look more granular into the details, they were very similar, but we see that HIT yielded an average loss of 1.26% body fat, whereas steady state yielded an average loss of 1.48% body fat. So although there was a slight advantage towards steady state cardio in many of the studies analyzed, it wasn't statistically significant. So we're seeing very similar effects. And the reason for this is because most of these studies were work equated, meaning that both sessions, whether it be hit or steady state, they made sure it was work equated. So essentially they were, they were having the same increases in energy expenditure. However, within this meta-analysis or the systematic review and meta-analysis, they also ran some separate analyses. And so one of the analyses that they ran was comparing continuous cardio versus hit protocols in studies where the steady state cardio durations were a little bit longer. And the hit cardio sessions were more time efficient. So they were of lower time durations. And what they found when they compared those groups head to head was that the results favored continuous cardio over hit training for total body fat reduction. Now, there's also a great systematic review and meta-analysis that was conducted in 2021, which looked at randomized control trials comparing interval training and steady state cardio to see their effects on body composition change. And the main purpose or objective of this review was to compare the body composition outcomes between both methods of cardio, specifically looking at changes in fat mass and fat-free mass. And their analysis found very similar reductions in fat mass with both types of cardio with minimal differences between conditions. So minimal differences between hit training or continuous steady state cardio. So neither had an advantage over the other when it came to fat mass loss. So the best available research and evidence that we have on the topic finds that hit and steady state have very similar outcomes when they're work equated, meaning when, you know, um, when you're matching the amount of work that you're doing and the amount of calories you're expending. So overall, just to wrap up this podcast, cardio is an effective form of exercise for both boosting your metabolism and improving your body composition and metabolic health in the process. Cardio, and this is something I really want to get across, is cardio can increase total daily energy expenditure and improve metabolism in, in multiple formats. So first, it's going to increase resting metabolic rate between somewhere in the area of 80 to 100 calories for 24 hours after the session. And then it also increases both total daily energy expenditure and EPOC. And the exercise activity thermogenesis, aka the total amount of calories you burn or will burn during a cardio session, is highly dependent on how long of a cardio session you do. Whereas the EPOC, meaning the afterburner or the post-exercise calorie expenditure, is heavily dependent by how hard you push yourself during those sessions. However, Overall, cardio is an effective tool for increasing energy expenditure, and it's actually more effective at doing so within a session itself than resistance training is because cardio is a form of exercise that's done continuously, which is also why in certain interventions that look at steady state cardio versus HIIT training, 
steady state cardio, if it's, you're just looking at a randomized control trial, a lot of times steady state will win out just because it's going to burn more calories because it is continuous. Whereas with the HIIT training, a lot of times if they utilize a full rest period, they're actually burning less calories for that same session. So overall, when it comes to maximizing your metabolism, burning fat and improving your body composition, one of the reasons why I'm such an advocate for what I refer to as a multimodal approach to body composition change, where I'm dialing in my client's diets, their resistance training, their aerobic training or their cardio programs, and their steps and physical activity levels is because I found that taking a multifaceted approach leads to better physique and health outcomes. And I truly believe a healthy body is a responsive body. So I try to use tools together that are synergistic as many of the methods are greater when combined together than when one is only done in isolation. So it's almost like that philosophy of the, the sum is greater than, than independent parts, essentially. So, you know, when it comes down to increasing energy expenditure and metabolic rate, like I, I reviewed on these last few podcasts, we have many tools that we can use at our disposal. We have nutritional strategies. We have resistance training. We have building muscle. And then we also have cardio. And we should utilize each of these tools if your goal is to maximize not only your body composition outcomes, but your, your metabolism, your metabolic health, and your, your energy expenditure levels so that you can feel better, you can look better, you can live a life of, of abundance, essentially, where you're able to eat more calories because you're burning more calories. But overall, guys, that's it for another episode of the Chasing Clarity podcast. But before I hand it off to you, Jeff, to close this out, I do want to ask a few things from you guys in the audience. You know, I rarely ask for anything, but I did want to make sure that we do a few things going forward. Uh, first, please make sure you're subscribed to the show on iTunes and you're also following on Spotify. I know that they changed it a little bit on Spotify. Just make sure that you hit the follow and you have the show being downloaded to your um, podcast platform, essentially. The next is if you enjoyed this episode or any others, please do share the show to your Instagram stories and be sure to tag both myself and Jeff because we love seeing those first and foremost, but it also helps to essentially get more exposure to the show where people that you are close to, friends, family members, clients, they're able to get the benefits of the show just like you did. And then last but not least, I would love if you guys could provide us with some feedback on the show. This has been essentially like a labor of love for me. And Jeff knows this. I put a lot of time and effort into the show, trying to put, put out very high quality content, making sure that it's evidence-based. I'm always making sure that I'm reviewing up-to-date literature. I spend a, an immense amount of time reading into studies and, and then also taking, it, it's not just about being able to read research. Anyone can, can read a study and then, you know, put something out. It's really about taking that research and, and really applying it to an evidence-based practice where it's considering the best available research first and foremost, and really teasing through this. This isn't me reading abstracts. This is me going into supplementary files and really digging in deep. And that's why Jeff, you know, oftentimes on podcasts will be like, dude, I know this is a good study. If you, you had, you know, high praise for it, because I, I'm a critical individual. I am a critical thinker and I really dig through things because I want to be able to provide the most balanced uh, viewpoint on a topic. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it is about the experience of the clinician or in our case, the coach. So my uh, personal experience in the trenches with clients and then also considering the clients that we work with and the audience out there. So I really try to take an evidence-informed approach where I really try to present things in a manner where it's it's informational, it's evidence-based, but it's also practical. And that's really what matters because you can have all the information in the world, but if you can't apply it, it's useless. So guys, if you enjoy the show, please do be sure to give us feedback, um, you know, share the show, and then also make sure uh, you're subscribed. Jeff, close us on out, my man. Uh, bro, you know, I want to say like, he guys ladies and gentlemen he does a lot spends a lot of time on this stuff i literally just hop on here to kind of make sure if there's any points i might want to know or whatever and just help try to bring out the best of brandon which he doesn't need much much of that at all because he's awesome so we appreciate you putting it together but if you guys are looking to find me i am on social media i'm on instagram i'm on tiktok as jeff unbreakable black if you guys are looking to get a copy of my book signed by me it's jeffunbreakableblack.com and for more about me if you look for other places i am on a podcast known as atg uh the jeff scooby robo show i just kind of hang out with my bros here in nashville hopefully i get brandon to move here and he gets to jump in and record with me and I'll be stuff. there in august my friend yeah so um with that being said share give us some love and if you guys need anything holla see you peace